Michael Portillo on Times Radio. George Orwell died on the 21st of January 1950, 72 years ago today. Well, I'm very pleased to welcome back to the programme Henry Elliott, author of the Penguin Classics book, who's produced a podcast on Orwell, which runs for an hour entitled On the Road. Henry, lovely to see you in the studio. Thank you for having me. Um, Let's sort of go through his career a little bit uh, Mm. chronologically. How could Orwell, who was an Etonian, (laughs) go through the experiences of living as a tramp and working in filthy hotel kitchens, described in his novel Down and Out in Paris and London, published in 1933? Yes, it's a bit of a a contradiction, isn't it, an old Etonian? Uh, Well, I think the thing about George Orwell is he was a man of contradictions. All through his life, there were different facets to his personality. And yes, his his family worked hard to get him a scholarship to go to Eton. He he described himself as coming from a, I, I think he called it a, a, a lower middle upper class background. So it so was quite a sort of uh, mixed background. And he did go to Eton. He he met Cyril Connolly there. He was taught briefly by Aldous Huxley, but he didn't do very well at his schoolwork. And he didn't think he could go to university. Um, afterwards, he he took the exams to get into the Indian Imperial Army and went and worked in Burma as a policeman. And it was while there that he started to, his his politics started to change, his views started to change, and he became fascinated by deprivation and poverty and wanted to really get close to it and see what it looked like. So um, he chose to be a tramp, he chose to work in the filthy conditions of the hotel kitchens, did he? That's right. In in, in London, in, in the east end of London, around Limehouse, and then in Paris, working as a as a dishwasher in a hotel. He As a plongeur. As a plongeur. A, a lovely word. I remember it from reading the novel. <laughs> it's great. Yes, he he, he did. He, he took on this um, other character. Of, he called himself P.S. Burton, and he would go to friends' houses in London to change into his his kind of uh, vagrant clothes. And then he would go and spend nights living in these homeless hostels and, mm. and working. Uh, and I think what's really impressive about Orwell is that he he clearly cared so much about, uh, about being authentic and getting to the heart of what he wanted to know about and what yes. he wanted to write about. Yes. And this feel, felt <clears throat> to him like the only way to write about poverty was to experience it. I, I read that novel... Um, when I was young, I was on a very long journey when I had no opportunity to wash for a while and I was feeling pretty <laughs> dirty. Um, 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 through reading the novel, I felt like I was covered in lice. I, I, was, I completely associated with his uh, experience. So uh, some of the novels of the late 1930s, I'm thinking of Keep the Aspidistra Flying mm. and Coming Up for Air, uh, seem to express an intense dissatisfaction with middle-class life. Um Firstly, do you agree with that? And and secondly, what kind of world was Orwell advocating by then? Yeah, that's a that's a good point because he, uh, yeah, he those novels are quite autobiographical. He um, he decided he wanted to be a writer, and so he um, he got a um, a job. He, he left the army. He left the sorry the police force in Burma, mm. and came um, to live in England as as a poet and he a struggling poet. He found a part time job working uh, at a second hand bookshop in. Hampstead called Book Lover's Corner. And while he was working there, he was getting the ideas for Keep the Aspidistra Flying, which, yes, as you say, is a novel about a man who who wants to be a poet, but he finds that his this, this sort of slippery slope down into poverty forces him out of those dreams. He can't doesn't have the headspace to think about it. And so yeah, I think this is this is getting towards the tipping point of of Orwell's thought and and politics. And I think it was really in the late 30s that um, he had these very formative experiences which really shaped the, the Orwell that's most famous today, I think. Mm. You, you referred earlier to his um, insistence on living what he was writing about. Mm. So in The Road to Wigan Pier, which was mm. published in 1937, he, he embarks on a long walk which takes him through the industrial Midlands. He eventually arrives at Wigan, uh, observing conditions on the way, I, I have followed in his footsteps to Wigan, mm. looking for the pier, mm. which, of, which of course is not quite what you expect. <laughs> it's, it, it's, a, it's a very tiny structure, but nonetheless, it was where shipping pulled up on the river. Um, now, is it right to think that this book um, is perhaps his clearest exposition of uh, of his socialism? I think that's right. This is exactly when he's starting to explore. I think, again, what I think is brilliant about Orwell is it's very hard to pin 
politics onto him because mm. he was changing the whole time. He mm. was examining himself all the time and changing how he felt about things. And frankly, he was living through such changeable times, you know, the 30s and then the Second World War. These labels like socialism were changing meaning for people the whole time. But I think for him, he 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 stuck to what he described as democratic socialism. And I think for him, it was the heart of it was reaching out to the poor and and understanding the living conditions of the fellow citizens of a country. And yes, gosh, you can't get much closer to it than the road to Wickham Pier, where he goes and lives above a tripe shop right in the heart of this industrial heartland. And from that position, having sort of brought you as a reader to that spot, he then sets forth his views on socialism. And it's no surprise that later that year, that was published in 1937, um, that earlier in 1937, he went to... Uh, to Catalonia to fight um, in the Spanish Civil War against fascism. Indeed, he did. Um, homage to Catalonia well, reflects those experiences during the Spanish Civil War. He enlisted, I think, as a militiaman. Mm -hmm. um, I was amazed to rediscover today that the book was published in 1938, so the Spanish Civil War hadn't even finished right. yes. when the book was published. Um, while he's in Spain, uh, he encounters the chaos of the anti-fascist yeah. side, which is riven by divisions between anarchists and various factions of communists and socialists. How would you summarise the impact of the Spanish Civil War on um, Orwell? Gosh, well, I think I think it really was a turning point for him. He, he said later in an essay called Why I Write that the Spanish War turned the scale and thereafter I knew where I stood. Every line of serious work that I've written since 1936 has been written directly or indirectly against totalitarianism. And so I think, he, I think what the Spanish Civil War did for him was showed him what a fascist totalitarian regime could do to people. And what it does to people is fractures them and turns their lives into chaos. He was really frustrated by the chaotic um, nature of the resistance in, in Spain. And in fact really suffered from it you know he he came under suspicion he was um you know he was considered to be a fascist himself for a time and he was accused of being a trotsky you know there was all kinds of uh, um you know views of, of what side he was on he also um was uh, very badly injured he was he was shot in the neck by a by a sniper's bullet and you know very nearly died and his and his his voice was never the same afterwards um yes uh, no, he was very, very lucky to survive that. Uh, I think another experience he had was that the, they stole uh, all his notes. Right. All his belongings, I think, yeah. All, just... Including, I mean, I imagine yeah. amongst his belongings, the most important thing would have been his notes. Yes, yes. Um, an extraordinary well, experience. And you say that it turned him against totalitarianism, and you, and you mentioned the fascists, mm. but maybe it also made him look at all totalitarianism because um, it wasn't all that much later... Uh, well, well, it was actually. It was 1945 that he published Animal Farm, which appears to be a fairy tale. Um, it is actually a parody of Stalinism. Mm -hmm. um, let's take a trailer from a film, Animal Farm. Come and visit Animal Farm, where all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. <laughs> Meet its quite extraordinary inhabitants. The wise and wishful old major. But remember, now and forever, all animals are equal. Napoleon, a pig of a dictator. Squealer of the sly eye and lying tongue. Long live Napoleon. And Snowball, who is hounded out of his animal kingdom. Love Boxer, who works like a horse. His faithful friends, Benjamin the Willing Donkey. <laughs> Muriel, who acts the goat. <laughs> then, of course, there's the drunken farmer, Jones, who gets his just desserts. And Wimper, who wangles and barters till it hurts. Remember then to visit Animal Farm. Make certain you watch Pig Brother just as he is watching you. Well, what an extraordinary piece of archive. Yes. Uh, a 1954 animated version of the film, uh, uh, animated version of the book, 
uh, and that was its trailer. Well, now, how had he become so disillusioned um, mm. with Stalinism? How had the scales fallen from his eyes? Well, you're right to say that it came on the back of a Spanish Civil War because, in fact, he wrote Animal Farm before um, the First World, before the Second World War. He tried to get it published in 1940, and because at that stage Stalin was now an ally of Britain, he couldn't get it published. So he was really frustrated by this. And it, you're right; it wasn't until 1945 that it came out. He was he couldn't believe that Britain was uh, allied with um, with Stalin after all the purges and after all the you know atrocities that he'd committed and um this is exactly what i mean by the idea of this word socialism being bandied around and 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 kind of warped by different uh, powers around the world i think orwell found that very frustrating you know he said um uh you know um you know he he saw himself as a democratic socialist and he didn't recognize the socialism that was going on in in russia especially in the 1930s and 40s Actually, that uh, trailer, although slightly absurd, was quite useful in reminding one about some of the characters and, 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 and how the book um, develops. Now, in 1949, he publishes 1984, yes. which I think is probably his most enduring book. It's certainly the case that there are words and phrases from the book that are still current in the English language today. Absolutely. You know, familiar words like Big Brother, Thought Crime, Room 101. That book, um, more than any of his others has kind of entered the culture and is used all the time. You know, I feel like uh, almost um, every week there's a news story where someone will say that a situation is Orwellian or, or, or draw on the imagery of 1984 to describe uh, the situation. It is an extraordinary book, and it's interesting that he described Animal Farm as a fairy tale because there is something of a fable about 1984. It's almost become a myth for the modern age. It's a, it's a story that we go back to again and again to, um, you know, to try and understand each successive um, situation. It's interesting that when, um, uh, at the inauguration of Donald Trump, uh, there was a huge rise in the sales figures of 1984 in the UK and America, and it was almost as if people were, you know, reaching for the handbook to see how to deal with this new situation. I, I, I think it's extraordinary the way that he for, foresaw the way in which people could mm. be observed uh, and controlled, the way in which their minds could be uh, altered, because these are still very much themes that we are uh, dealing with today. Um, you, you wrote your book on Penguin Classics, and Orwell has played a very big part in the history of Penguin Classics. Would you attempt an assessment of George Orwell? I think he's, uh, as Andrew Motion, the former poet laureate, said, he's an anchor man braced in the middle of the century that people can look to for inspiration and as a warning. And you've produced a podcast. A word or two about mm. that? So, yes, it's a podcast. Um, in each episode, I, I talk to a different guest about a different book. And next Thursday, the 27th, the first episode of the new season is on 1984. And I walk around London visiting the sites that inspired the locations in 1984 with the theatre director Robert Icke, who uh, has adapted and directed a stage adaptation of 1984. And he's got wonderful insights into how he turned that book into a play. Do you have a favourite yourself? Of Orwell's? Mm. I think it would have to be 1984. I mean, Animal Farm in 1984, they, you know, he said that when he wrote Animal Farm, it was the first time he fused his political purpose with his artistic purpose. And I think he does that perfectly in those two books. Um, Henry Elliott, thank you so much for coming in again and speaking so eruditely about uh, George Orwell, who died 72 years ago today. Well... <laughs>